Hello, ladies and gents. Welcome back to Rushcast. I am Joe from Nightmare Cabin, and I'm joined as ever by my very good friend, Paul Conroy, drummer extraordinaire. Oh, oh I just broke, dropped your CD. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Outtake. Here we go. Audio scope, <laughs> secrets and lies. Check out their debut album. And uh, you're in a couple of different cover bands as well, Paul. Have you got anything coming up over the festive season? Any no. uh, Christmas markets or? No, 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 nothing like that. No private um, functions or anything like that. No, no, it's nothing like that at the moment. The thing I have been doing is working with my brother, going through some edits a couple of songs that we're recording which is the second audio scope album so we're, we're sort of fin doing some finishing touches with the drums and the bass on the last couple of songs so we've been doing that but no my last gig was at the end of november that was the last gig i've, I've done That's with it, yeah so i'm sort of quite relieved really it's nice just to be able to relax a little bit it and is concentrate when you... more on the original material with yeah, the audio scope, and when uh, you have CD. got a bit of a pack schedule and things come and go, and then you get that bit afterwards when you're like, I've got nothing to yeah. do. It's quite yeah, nice, exactly. isn't it? Uh, it is very nice. It's very nice. Anyway, how, how are you have... doing, Joe? How oh, are you doing? I've not got enough hours in a day. I'm spinning all the plates at the moment. But <sighs> here we go. I say I like it. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't keep doing it to myself, would I? Yes, yeah, it. So, Yes, we are we are coming to the end of uh, we are slowly approaching the end of Rushcast. We have uh, if this is your first show, this is the show where we are going through the entire back catalogue of Rush. We're doing an album at a time, and yeah, by the counting of it, we've got about six or seven shows left. So I think it's something like that. Yeah, yeah, what we've um, we've gone through this really quick. It's uh, yeah, it's been um, well. How have you enjoyed it? Because you're new to all this. Well, I am I'm completely new to this. Uh, well, as I shared with you, I think the first one I was sort of quite anxious about, not anxious, but apprehensive, apprehensive and thinking, yeah. apprehensive and thinking, you know, is this going to really work? Am I going to have enough things to say? Yeah, and all this sort of thing, because it could have been 10 minutes and finished. Um, <laughs> But it's been far from that. I, I have enjoyed it. I've I've enjoyed doing this, but also just the process of just listening through the rush back catalogue, which I haven't done for a very, very long time. Yeah, and you probably wouldn't have, would you? You wouldn't have gone, no, like, I'm going to set aside no. a week for each album and work my way through mm. it. Bum, 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 bum. You wouldn't have done that if you were And I think, obviously, and, and delving off into the solo uh album of Alec Lifeson last time. Um I haven't listened to Victor for absolutely ages. You that know, has uh, been one of the highest watched ones we've done so far. It's not the it highest, good? but in terms of views per time when it was released, hmm. we um we slowly get around 60 to 70 views over the course of a couple of weeks. That adds about 60 views after three days and i hadn't had a chance to share it wow well wow. and i have there been any of those though um we <laughs> tend to get, any... yeah we do tend to get a few likes but um i got some comments as well but i can't remember if that was on the page or the well right, funny, funny enough those a lot of people do seem to really like that album it's so strange isn't it yeah it, well you know everybody's entitled to their opinion yeah and... We don't all have the same. I didn't realise and... how popular the album was, though. It seems to be considered an underrated gem. But yeah. Yeah, it was about a week or so after we the show went live that I actually managed to sit down and share it in a load of Facebook groups, and I ended up um, joining a load of Alex Lifeson groups in particular. Oh, as okay, well. yeah, and um, and it, we've. I've got quite a few more subscribers since then as well. I'm just teetering cool. on 600 subscribers now. So oh, cool. it's looking cool. like we're getting new listeners. So cool, I implore yeah. you all, if you go onto the channel's main page and just click on the playlist section, uh, there is rush cast. Everything we've done so far is all put in a list for you. So it's like a, a little box set for you to binge through. So go get your rush albums out. Yeah. Either use this as an introduction or listen to it yourself until you're ready. 
and use this as an afterthought. And then uh, put your comments in below and tell us what you think, what you agree on, what you disagree on. And uh, yeah, join in the discussion. So this week we are doing test for Echo. As I say, we had a slight deviation last week and we got another deviation next week. But at the meantime, we're back with Rush. And uh, mm -hmm. test for Echo was, uh, let's give it some facts and figures and statistics here. I closed the book without, here we go. Released in uh, 1996, September the 10th. Mm -hmm. uh, recorded in Woodstock, New York. At Reaction Studios, Toronto. Because I thought that was America for a minute there. But, um, yeah, produced this time by uh, Peter Collins. is back on board. And um, apparently Kevin Shirley did do a bit of work on in the background as well. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we even get a... We even get someone chipping on the lyrics for one of the songs as well. Well, yeah, that's um, Pi Do Boys again. Um, I'm glad you said that because yeah, I think I think that's how he's pronounced anyway. <laughs> but yeah, he's um, I would have done a Del Boy then. Uh, and... Yeah, the, well, I did a Del, yeah. I did a Del Boy all the time anyway with a with a French good grief, I muller it completely. Uh, yeah, muller. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There you go. See, you're better than I am. Um, but yes, yeah, so of course, uh, Pi, Pi is um, Mac West, Max Webster's lyricist and a long association with Piet. So, of course, you know, he's um, he's contributed a few, obviously beginning with Tom Sawyer. And uh, there's been a few others since then. Um, so, yeah, it, uh, it's interesting that you said about them recording, because I've got here recorded at Bearsville Studios, Bearsville, New York, which is now another defunct recording studio yeah they did say best for studio i just said the location i just skipped it yeah um or, or or i should say new york um uh and peter collins again overseeing the production of this one uh what else have you got about this before i not much up? in terms of facts and things i've got a few um comments from the book i'm reading i've, I've been i had a look at the uh Rush magazine that you oh, can't right, yeah. you got a whole um thing from Peter Collins on here. I don't know how much of it you want me to read out, but uh Oh, well, I think whatever you think's whatever you think's interesting and you know to really uh, well we yeah. I'd started working with Rush again after a six year hiatus on Counterparts, the album before Test for Echo. For that record, we made a very distinct choice to go as organic as we could. Test for Echo was a natural progression from that. What I particularly remember is that Alex and Getty had done a lot, a lot more work in pre-production. They would put down their ideas down together and record their own and send it off to Neil, who was in a different room writing lyrics. They were much more adept at moving things around on the computer. There was much more cerebral work in the laboratory rather than hammering it all out in a rehearsal environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did the track in at Bearsville Studio. The band had recorded there, so had Dylan. And Tess for Echo had a kind of 60s influence. That influence has always been there, but you can really hear it here. Carve Away the Stone was a bit of The Who, a bit of Hendrix and a bit of Jefferson Airplane, but has a, also has a character of its own. I can't hear that myself, but... Well, we can talk about it yep. when we get to that song. Uh, there's humour in there too. Resist opens with an Oscar Wilde line about learning to resist anything but temptation. And mm -hmm. Dog Years is a wonderful example of Neil's humour and also shows how you can take a whimsical subject and put a layer of social commentary too. It was before Neil had the great tragedies in his life, so there's a sense of where his mind was at before it all changed. Right. We brought in Kevin Caveman Shirley as engineer on Counterparts, and he worked on Echo as well. He made Alex go and play in front of his amp instead of the control room, which Alex really liked, even though he objected at first. And he could get a great drum sound for Neil, for Neil in 45 minutes rather than a whole day. Plus, Neil had been working extensively with jazz drummer and teacher Freddie Gruber to change his style from being on top of the beat to really getting behind it. By the time of Tess for Echo, he'd really locked into that. He could easily switch between more circular motion and really crisp, precise approach. 
It always blew my mind how open Rush were. They wanted to hear what I had to say. They didn't always accept everything, but they were fascinated to know what opinions I had. They were always looking to progress and do something different, and they always succeeded. They did indeed. Yeah, some interesting comments there. Again, I think you've sort of said a lot of what I've got on the like the intro bit in, that I've got in my book about it. The interesting thing about uh, this album is it was nearly three years after Counterparts, which was the longest stretch. Yes, yeah, that's, that's, uh, obviously that was for numerous standards, reasons. Yeah, yeah, by numerous reasons. Uh, Geddy Lee uh, had a young family. Uh, his wife had given birth to their daughter, so he was bonding there. And obviously, Lifeson went on his solo project. And Neil Peart, as you mentioned, um, basically went into a period of study with uh, Freddie Gruber, in which he totally rearranged his it, not totally rearranged the kit, but he moved the kit about a bit to, and started using the traditional grip rather than the match grip that most drummers use. He started using the jazz grip uh, on the sticks and he plays the majority of this album with that traditional grip, which gives it a slightly different feel. And he's, he's, yeah. he's, 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 he's drumming is a lot looser on this than it, is on previous albums and Peart said he, he at this point in time he would metronomically he, he was pretty accurate but he felt that there was a certain stiffness to his playing yeah with going into the, the doing the jazz studying and obviously this was around the time obviously of or well, it was just after the Buddy Rich tribute and stuff like that he got switched on to playing in a slightly more relaxed way um and it just rejuvenated him really i think he, he yeah so, i remember in the documentary he said he felt he was getting very mechanical and very robotic when yeah he, well that's where i'm lifting it from because i was lot, listening i was, yeah, I was reviewing to... that today yeah off of uh beyond the lighted stage so it's the words of the man himself um but it was it's interesting i can't remember who the guy was who spoke afterwards, he said it was just refreshing that you got Neil Peart regarded as one of the best drummers in the world Think saying, I can still learn. Yeah. And coming back and just looked very fresh and relaxed. And Didn't he, he as well just get a, a bare bones basic kit and went, right, you're going to you got to learn yeah. on this yeah. again. And yeah, a lot more snare snare work and and that sort of thing. It, it with it, it um, and it does. I mean, you you can hear if anything, he's sort of more laid back on this album. Although there's still Neil Peart's signature stuff, but it's more um, sparse to what it was in the past. So that was um, I. I mean, obviously as a drummer myself. It that fascinated me that it, it just goes to show that even someone as great as he was, um, knew that there was room always room for improvement and that he wasn't done, you know. So, you know, I've arrived, I've so that, that's good, and I think that's an inspiration for any any musician in any in any straight or form. But you're saying about the 90s, 1960s, um, that's what I've got here. It says here, a closer inspection reveals, however, that while counterparts drew on Rush's love for the so-called British invasion bands of the 1960s, it says here, Test for Echo is an album that reflects contemporary alternative rock bands of the 1990s. But you said it, on your one, it said they were more influenced in the 60s. Which yeah. Is, it, it, it this anyway. is sort of, it sort of turned it around the other way. Um, it says it, uh, and it says consequently, Test for Echo sounds more dated than its predecessor, i.e., counterparts whose timeless influences are still in vogue to this day. And I probably wouldn't, I prefer counterparts to this album, 
and I think it has dated better than this album. And I think yeah, it might be more uh, on the subject matter. Probably. On the uh, book there, the two people that um, are being interviewed for it actually have a bit of uh, back and forth over the production, mm -hmm. which I could read out to you. If you yeah, of course. Yeah, um, go for it. But uh, one thing I wanted to add as well, um, reading Ghost Rider, uh, Neil's book about mm -hmm. the time that followed this period, um, it kind of starts off about this album and this tour and um it's funny enough he uh again i read it twice because i I've, i started the book and got a few chapters in and you know uh, things happen that you just sort of lose grip with it and it's well, yeah you, so get I, side, you get sidetracked don't so you? um i started the book again and made yeah. sure i did read it right he considers this from a drumming point of view his masterpiece yeah he does yeah um, or he did, yeah. Yeah, I can't see that myself. Um, but not that his drumming's bad on it in any way, but I just find his drumming on this... Uh, Some people just... would call it more pedestrian. Yeah. Like with um, um... I said what, what makes a distinctive drummer for me is uh, when you've got the... the, uh, the whatever song on full blast and you're playing air guitar yeah the distinctive drummer you will be air yeah. drumming and air drumming. Absolutely. you know is the you know and, people, and he was the epitome of it in meant a phase to the footage in any it. rush because everyone's yeah. you know yeah, abs because absolutely. his parts are just as bum, da, 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 bum, 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 well, it's, da, yeah. you know it's it's not just keeping time, it's integrity. It's, it's, yeah, it's, you know, that it, little drum so feel from Sound of uh, Radio, which I just did, you know, it's yeah. it's just as much as part of the song as the riffs are. Yeah, it's woven, are. it's woven into the tapestry. And um, the I song, feel yeah. sometimes, I, f I forget Neil's even there some some of the time on this well, one. It is, so. it, it, it is an incredibly laid back yeah, I, performance, how... but it's probably, there is a lot more subtlety going on, and that might be the reason why he said that it was his masterpiece yeah there's a, there's a lot of it's a lot more um there's a lot of rudimentary drumming going on in this yeah and that's why he he regards it or he regarded it i should say um but yeah two of the people that are interviewed on this particular album one is the founder of uh rush con yeah the, uh, the rush convention um mm -hmm. And then another one is a another Rush historian, but um, I thought this was quite funny because they both disagree. Um, how would you classify or describe the production job on this uh, record? And uh, they are Eddie Maxwell and Douglas Mayer. Okay. And Douglas says uh, the album itself is terribly produced. <laughs> um, Peter Collins just doesn't did not belong there by that point. It just didn't make any sense, not at all. And again, we found ourselves in a position where we had a song like Test for Echo that comes out, enters in at number one for album for the album-orientated rock charts, where they make no music video for it. Now, that's not to say that it would have been played on MTV if it had come out, but still, well, that's nothing to do with the production, is it? I don't know what they are. Uh... No. Had to do with anything um and then maxwell replies what peter collins brings is a bit of jangle a cleanness so it's not that crunchy it's clean now that's that's yeah that, that's where i come in because counterparts had a very raw live feel to it absolutely and it feels like on this album we've gone back to yeah the, uh, the rem years yeah um, that's that's my feeling about it as yeah. well and uh yeah, it's very crisp. I can hear all the instruments. I can hear Getty very well. It's very balanced. And that's what I thought of Power Windows the first time I heard it, is that it's very balanced. Nothing is getting lost in both Test for Echo and Power Windows. Well, yeah, that's the thing as well. But I don't know. Yeah. I'll... Being clean and being crisp is one thing, but you want... You, you want, want that... Di yeah, you want that dynamic. Yeah. I don't think this sounds as dynamic as Counterparts. As an album, but the I've... intro to um, the intro to animate alone 
just that. Yeah. Bum, 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 ding, ding, yeah. ding, bum, bum, you know, the bass is right up there. Yeah, to, to me, it feels you, live. It, yeah, yeah. It, well, it feels like they're in the room with you. Yeah, that's what it feels like, whereas it doesn't on this album. Yeah, now some people might say, well, you know, horses for courses, you know, I prefer it that way, man. So fine. Um, it, it's to me, it's not as powerful, it is not as powerful as powerfully sounding as its predecessor. And I would agree with what it says here. I think this one has dated yeah. uh, more than Counterparts has. You could still put Counterparts on today and you would think, you know, it's still there. You know, it, do, it it's almost got a timeless quality to it. Whereas I think this one, you can definitely tell this is 90s. Mm. You know, um, it's, so, yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's have, a mixed it, bag for me going through forward yeah, um it's um, not yeah it, it, as always there's some great bits on it and then there's some bits that yeah not as not up there not probably more like a, a b list or something i mean it says here despite its occasionally thrilling riffs test for echo sees life and returning to the role of a soundscape architect applying his sonic textures as a backdrop to lee's prominent vocal melodies and then it goes on about Peer being more laid back. It says here, uh, Lee's work on the album is as a singer and songwriter first and bassist second. And it says, consequently, while the album, while mature, features little of the youthful exuberance that excited many Rush fans at the beginning of their career. And you've already said about uh, this album would be the final Rush studio album before the great hiatus uh, during which many, including the band themselves, uh, Alex and Getty thought that this, they would never play again and that this was the final album. Um, and we can talk about that later, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, it, and it says it, it is even more so than any other Rush album, the end of an era. But yeah just, okay so that it's one way it, it. It just, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just the comments i mean obviously mm. on a personal level obviously for neil it was definitely the end of um uh, an era so and uh so that's all i've got are we ready uh yeah are we gonna are we gonna test for echo is anyone out there hello yeah is this thing working yeah yeah is, is this thing on <laughs> um yeah, the, I mean, the, the album opens up interestingly enough. I mean, and this has like a, it has a sort of, like they're they're taking notes from their sort of counterparts, really, or or they're looking to bands that they've influenced that are now coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, I read somewhere that when they did the tour with Primus, it kind of, it made them interested in their own band again because you had this really cool, quirky, heavy, crazy band. Um, in Primus um, opening for them and they're really enjoying watching them and getting yeah. you know the energy from them but Les Claypool and the guys from Primus are saying to them how much they love Rush and yeah. they're making them dig out their old albums and stuff that they'd sort of put on the shelf or maybe forgotten about and moved on from they're, mm. uh, yeah we've, we've done quite a bit actually and these guys seem to like it you know so I'm thinking the Test for Echo song, the way it sort of stops and starts. You've got those clean clean guitars at the beginning, but the way it sort of verges in, Test for Echo, you know, and then you've got that call of riff and the, the way it sort of just, you know, it kind of I just mean, comes there's, together. There's a lot of Tom work on that. And it's really yeah, good. I'm, I'm thinking, are they listening to, have they taken notes from Primus? I'm probably taking some notes from Dream Theater as well. They've got that progressive feel in a very um contemporary rock yeah 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 it definitely i mean on this one again you've got various uh time changes again on this and uh it the way that they've stitched this particular song together is uh i think it's very interesting great opener i mean i just love the way the guitar comes in like that anyway it's a nice sounding guitar pick and you're just getting those accents underneath the 
the voice before, as you say, it sort of lets rip with that sort of uh, very spiky arpeggiated guitar and the drums are going for it as well and the bass is rumbling along underneath and then it all cuts back again when the the voice comes back in again you know it just uh i i think possibly on throughout the old the whole album i would say this is probably the most dynamic song of the lot definitely yeah and it's it's definitely to me an interest it's a good interesting album yeah, opener, i think it's so. i think it's it's quite a strong opener to me, yeah. anyway, um, whether everybody else would agree with that, I don't know. Um, no, but, I, I like it as an opener. It, it kind of doesn't reveal itself all at yeah. once. It kind of unfolds, and it's got a nice little odd structure, which just goes to show Rush are still, still willing to play with their audience and keep them guessing. Yeah, yeah um, I think so. Yeah. Um, interesting... It's sort of a solo, but it sort of isn't it, it, to me. But I like the guitar in that middle section where he sort of just takes it up a notch. And then it, uh, halfway through that, there's a second guitar line that comes in, which is like a harmony of it. That uh, that's, it sort of lifts it up quite nicely. And then really sort of sounds like he's shredding the guitar at the end of that. And you've got Pierre really going for it with all the toms and everything just to bring it to a crescendo and then it little drum break and back into it the like one of the verses and it just it, it brings everything down again. I, mm -hmm. I like the way this particular song ebbs and flows. Uh any comments on the lyrics for this at all from you? Have you got anything on it or any sort of observation? No particular line really jumps out of me. I I guess it's a case of um it's talking of you know reaching out communication yeah and just the yeah to, to quote pink floyd is there anybody out there yeah yeah, yeah there is that bit I've, i'm just seeing if i've got anything uh you know I talked about the it says here about the wild and contract contrasting mixture of styles that are stitched together um definitely um it's got the heavy alternative rock style of the mid nineties in this. Um, this is the song that's a collaboration between Piet and uh, Du Bois. And it says here, Du Bois's lyrics are often impenetrable to understanding, but are this time quite clear. The song is a harsh commentary on the real time media world of infotainment news, the modern day freak shows of early reality TV, we all know how dreadful. Ooh, if only you knew. Neil. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, and it's absolutely dreadful reality TV. This is before um, Big Brother, even. Yeah, it's yeah, hard. exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah, and the commercialization of absolutely everything. Uh, <laughs> despite the fact the lyric has a clarity that much of Du Bois's other works lacks, other work lacks, I should say. Uh, this does not hinder the song's unusual and beautiful imagery. And it quotes a line, camera curves over caved in cop cars. And it says here, the song's title, Test for Echo, is a request for feedback, an attempt to ask if anyone else else's feelings reflect our own. Or as Piet himself put it, excuse me, does anybody else think this is weird? Am I weird? While the answer to these questions might be yes, it's good to know that you're not the only one, that you are not alone. Absolutely, That's, yeah. Cool. Yeah, just, totally uh, agree with that. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's uh it, I've got nothing else on I that, think man. it's I do think as well, I can I can say with confidence Neil Neil would have been on our side of things. I know I know like everyone on like all political things thinks George Orwell was on their side. <laughs> but but I do think uh I think Neil would have got it. I think a lot of the things we see and think about what's going on today, I think Neil would have would have been on there. He would yeah. have been in. Yeah. And um But yeah, who's gonna take the lead on the next track? Well Is it your turn to drive, Paul? I thought it was your turn to drive. Oh well it's my turn to drive. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um I hope I don't drive us into the margin of error on this next one. But um well, well, from the edge of control, I'll do my best. <laughs> and uh 
Yeah, Driven. What do you think of uh, Driven? I think this is a nice... They, in their later career, Rush got quite good at, at the uh, at the breezy song. The 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 op- I always describes this is this good great soundtrack for a good drive on the open road. Chorus not in, not intended, no pun intended with the yeah. chorus. But um, yeah, it's one of those nice open sort of yeah. breath of fresh air songs that they've become so. Yeah, good at I mean, in their late career. As soon as Alec Lyson kicks into that riff, you know it's immediately recognisable. Mm. Um, uh, it's again another one. It it's you've got time signature changes again in this one, definitely. And this one, I mean, this is on Russian Rio. On the which we'll obviously get to when yeah. we start talking about these things. Um, good version of it on there, but it um, it's quite powerful. It's quite dark actually. It's quite a dark sounding, darker sound with it, with the quite chunky guitar on this and Lee's vocals. His his vocals on this are quite melodic again, um, but I like the way it sort of just gradually develops with the texture of it. Uh, I've got a couple of bits about this. It's a, I don't know if I agree with this. It says here, the song's constant repetition of the short riff does arguably make the song overlong and perhaps under edited. I don't know. It, to oh, me, it does. It, to me, it doesn't seem to drag on when I hear this. Uh, it said here, it says here, Lee originally demoed the song with three bass tracks on the additional two to stand in for Lifeson's rhythm guitar. Lifeson, pleased with the arrangement, suggested that Lee keep all three bass lines in the final version in addition to Lifeson's guitar. This met with Lee's enthusiastic approval and so Driven remains one of Rush's most heavily textured guitar-based pieces. Um. I I I like it. I I I've always liked this one. Strangely enough, it's quite distinctive, and I also the the little the guitar sort of squeals quite a bit where he, before it comes back in after the solo, he sort of really go, gives it some, and then it comes in very very strong at the end of the particular song. Uh, of this particular song so i quite like it the simple but pleasing lyric i'm just quoting this again because it's a uh, pleasing lyric uses driving as a metaphor for life the balance between taking control of our own lives and allowing others to take the strain the multiple meanings and contexts of the word driven make the relatively simple lyric more effective Ultimately, and unsurprisingly, Peart suggests that it is a far better thing to be in control of oneself and indeed to take responsibility for one's own life with the line, it's my turn to drive. Um, yeah, I think it was quite a favourite. Yeah, I, I could see it going quite down quite well with... Um... Yeah, I think, I think it was quite, it was, it was more of a modern favourite for a lot of Rush fans from this album um i think this is the one that got played on subsequent other tours not every tour but certainly this one i could see you know the, the it, when it kicks up and then just cuts yeah. to the strumming it's my turn to drive yeah <sighs> yeah yeah i can imagine it being and, quiet and live obviously with with this particular song it cuts back in the middle and you get the bass coming. Mm. Well, Geddy live sort of goes to town a little bit on this. Yeah. It's almost like a little bass solo and then he brings it back in. So it's just a little, there's a little bit of indulgence in on this as well in the live. To do a little yeah. digression, have you seen any more clips of like, of Geddy's spoken words tour? No, I haven't. No. Because um, he's getting different. What's, seems really cool about it is that he's had a different co-host every show so the yeah. first night was Paul Rudd 
think he had the other guy from I Love You Man, another mate. He's had Jack Black. Yeah. Um. He's, yeah. He's had a number of different comedians and musicians. And, and Alec Lyson's been on as Alec well. Alec Lyson's yeah been on it. Uh, I don't know if he did the co-host or he just appeared. I just I don't know. Um, I can't remember. I, I see a picture of the Les Claypool from yeah. Primus has done one with him as well. So I've, I'm liking that every city. You've had that different person to. I think that's quite have, good. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. You know, rather than just having someone traveling around with him, mm. it could become a bit formulaic. Yeah, in that respect. And of course, so, every so everyone's got their own spin on things to ask, and the different questions. Obviously, the audience uh, they're becoming fewer and further between. I think he's, you know, how many times going to be asked? Are oh, Rush going to tour again? Yes. Um, yeah, I've heard I've heard something about it. I know that there's been a lot of talk about them doing something next year. Um but I think there is a certain hesitation now with regards to it. I heard I, I can't remember where I read it recently. Uh, the, the last thing I've read is they've got a drummer in mind. They have got a drummer in mind, have yeah, they? but they've not they're not yeah. saying who. And we can you know. I think really? Audio Scope's drummer would uh, probably. <laughs> Good grief! Yeah, <laughs> I'd but love you, to have a go, but you, I reckon I'd absolutely. You've been quiet did... lately, Paul. You've been hard. Yeah. To, you've been hard to nail down. I wonder. Yeah, been... yeah, yeah. It's uh... yeah. No, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> me, I'm just a rank amateur. You know. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just looking at the <laughs> lyrics on on this. Um... I think it's probably some of his sim- relatively simpler lyrics, but it gets the point across quite nicely, I think, and it's quite quaffable, isn't it? It's um, I'm just trying to see if there's any other lines that sort of leap out. Is there any of them again, or is it just a case that you just listen to it and just thought, yeah, I think it's my turn to drive. That's the one that really leaps out at you all the time, doesn't it? It didn't really leap out at me, particularly with lyrics or anything like no, that. No, it just... um, Again, I think we're back. We're, we're kind of... We're, we're still... There's more sort of progressive... I think they've, they've fully... They've fully embraced the prog rock title at this point in their career, but I think we are sort of back to <clears throat> Hold Your Fire and Presto in this on this album. We're back to the... to the... to the dad rock on most of the album to be fair just with a couple mm. of curveballs thrown in yeah here and there um yeah i don't i think lyrically this probably isn't it's not as good as um the previous album i don't yeah. think it i think the counterparts was definitely a, a real high point i think um so i dare say in that respect this album did have a fairly tall order i think to surpass it so yeah. Give it a good bit. I, I just don't think it's quite. It's not quite on the level with counterparts. In, no, to to me anyway. Some Let's people will argue it. Yeah, yeah. Half the world. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Funny play on words with the lyrics to this one. Um. I don't know. I quite appreciate it more. The more I listen to it. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh, again. It's a breezy number, <laughs> like I said about the last one. I quite like the opening. Bam, bam, bam. Dun, 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 dun. And the drums are pretty driving on this one when that when it does kick in that initial, dun, 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 bam, you know. But um, yeah, it does. It just sort of pushes it along. It's almost got that lazy sort of push along, but it it just propels the whole song forward. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it has a bit of a grungy feel as well, mm-hmm. but um. Yeah, I think a, a lot of the guitars textual. on this album do have a bit of that, yeah, bit of that. I think that I did read some of that they were listening to a lot of the grunge bands at that point, like yeah. Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and bands like that. I mean, they were, I mean, in 1996, I mean, Kurt Cobain had already been dead two years at that point. Well, yes, he had been. So the grunge explosion would have, uh, yeah. I mean, when, when did Super Unknown? Soundgarden come out. I mean, the thing is with these scenes, when the, when when the scene gets its name, it's normally it's already been and gone at that point. Is all the sort of Johnny Come Lately's are taken over at that point? 
I remember like in the 2000s when you had emo. Oh, to yeah. me, Quicksand yeah. and Far were emo bands. Mm-hmm. And they'd already split up in the two thousands. Yeah. Um, but then all of a sudden you had this emo come out and it's like, no, these bands ain't emo. It's uh yeah, it, it became like a look more. I think the same thing kind of happened with grunge when, when grunge was established and then everyone wanted to sound grunge, mm. the, the the best bands <clears throat> had already sort of released their masterpieces and were either split up or yeah. coming to the end. But yeah, indeed. I think, but yeah, yeah, I do I... feel that so, so Soundgarden were more one of the more sensible ones <laughs> out of that scene. Not, not quite as uh, nihilistic and you know, yeah. why was me? They had a bit more of a rock kick to them and a bit more of a obviously with Chris Cornell's Robert Plant esque whales, which he sort of toned down as they went on, but. Yeah, around the super unknown time, it became a bit more. What's the word? You could have played that album to your dad, you know. There's yeah. Black Hole Sun and songs like yeah. Spoon Man and yeah, um, so, yeah. I dare, yeah, I wouldn't disagree with what you've said. Actually, it. Um, but yeah. I think some of the guitar riffs and some of the the tone of the guitar. Yeah, it's the Quite textural. Yeah, it's the textural sounds, and there's quite a few sort of overdubs on this one. Whilst also there is also just that nineties, you know, even the sort of not so edgier bands like Hootie and the Blowfish or mm. or REM, or I keep bringing up as well, but REM just do a, you know, that they, they still there was still that nineties. Yeah, everyone was yeah. produced by Brendan well, O'Neill and. Yeah, exactly. Brandon O'Neill even. Is it Brandon? It all... No, Brandon Fraser. Brandon O'Neill's a journalist. Um Brandon Fraser, is that the producer? I, I I'm not sure. I have to quickly look sure. him up. I, I, you'll have to quickly look him up, Joe. But yeah, I I think you're you're right, you know, it, with with that. I think it, it no, Brandon Fraser's refl- in um Georgia yeah. the Jungle and the Mummy. <laughs> right, okay. So you you're right. cross splicing various media here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, Half the world, I mean, it's the shortest song on the album, and it was a minor hit for them. Um, it reached number six in the US Billboard mainstream rock chart. Uh, says here, primarily a vehicle for Peart's lyric. The song is a simple melody driven folk rock uh, song. On the track, Lyson can be heard performing acoustic guitar and the mandola as well as electric. Uh, it says here, while Peer uh, travelled throughout the world as a musician, perhaps his international state of mind really began to take hold after his bicycle travels, many of which were quite literally off the beaten track. His travels through China, well, we know about that because of Taishan, uh, and Africa, brought him into contact with ways of life that were unfathomably modest in comparison to those which are commonplace elsewhere. It is unsurprising then that Piet chose to write a song about how the other half live. Pleasingly, the song's lyric does not split the world neatly in two, depending on the qualities mentioned, an entirely different part of the world springs to mind. Although there may have been a temptation to split the world into the wealthy West, well, not so much now, and the suffering East. The song brings to mind the rich, the poor, the proud, the modest, the waxing and the waning, and all in the form of different places and peoples. Thus, it is in this mishmash of characteristics that the song gradually patches together the entire world and shows without too much cliche that we are all one people. Yeah, it was Brendan O'Brien. I said Brendan O'Neill. I can't. Brendan, know Brendan. Brendan O'Brien. Yeah, and um, he produced everything around that time. That guy's CV. Look it up. But anyway, yeah. No, did, did, he, uh, who, did he produce REM? I bet he did. Um, he produced uh, a lot of Bruce Springsteen albums. Oh right, yes. Yeah, later so on, Pearl Jam. I think is another one of his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, 
It's like because you, you, you've quoted REM quite a lot. <laughs> I'm just curious who who did the production for them on most of their stuff. Right, here we go. go. ACDC, Pearl Jam, Stone Temple Pilots, Soundgarden, Red yeah. Hot Chili Peppers, Bob Dylan, Rage Against the Machine, and Bruce Springsteen. There you go. There's uh, but not that's, REM. That's the opening paragraph of his uh thing. Yeah. Let's go through his discography. Uh, Kansas in the spirit of things, Black Crows, Shaking Money Maker, King's X. Oh, we're, oh, we're going to be covering King's X, uh, in the future. Yeah, Pearl Jam, Temple of the Dog, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, they like I, I said about grunge, where you got like a cornerstone of it, Pearl Jam and Temple of the Dog. Mm-hmm. Um, Stone Temple Pilots, that first album as well. Big Paul Westerberg, uh, from uh. The Replacements, he did his solo album. Um, oh, Aerosmith, so he did a lot of Aerosmith's post reunion okay, work. So... Soundgarden, Super Unknown. Mm-hmm. Um, Neil Young, Mirrorball, he did that. Well, one. he did Neil Young as well. Okay, yeah, uh, did the second Rage Against the Machine album. And uh, no, not one REM album, <laughs> right? Okay, <laughs> but yeah. Perhaps even he and was a couple of later. Um, <laughs> oh, look, then he's gone on to do like the Killers, Incubus. Oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. Blackberry Smoke and bands like Chemical Romance and Mastodon and Kill Switching Games. Yeah, the guy's got a CV as long as your arm. Yeah, definitely. Um, he's got an awful lot there. Yeah. Interesting that he did ACDC as well. Interesting. Very interesting that. Yeah. It, uh, Yes, I've got nothing else on half the world. It it sort of bounces along quite nicely and th- does it, and it's finished, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, let's go I mean, into it then. The Colour of Right. I mean, it just carries on. It's, yeah, the, the album's quite consistent, really. It's consistent as Rush albums go. It's kind of just breezes along quite nicely, and The Colour of Right just carries that on, really. You got. Nice big open colds, like well, starting off with a nice initial, you know, lick of guitar when it yeah. normally comes up with big, yeah. Bang, you know. Yeah, I, I must admit, I do like the big, it's quite big accents and that, and they're also slightly jagged as well. The extra ones that they're putting in it, and then it just cuts back to a, a nice little guitar, it's got a bit of a that, country riff to it as well. Yeah, just didn't. Underneath it all, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it's. Have you got anything else on it or Not much really? <laughs> okay, no, it's all right. So yeah, just some some songs do just plod along, don't they? Nicely. Yeah. Well, I think this one this one does as well. It just. I'm only going to read what the comments are on this. Is it's not an awful lot of it. Uh, it says mid tempo piece has little of the frenetic energy or complex musical ideas that Rush fans had come to expect. While the layered guitars provide a loud wall of sound, the light-hearted melodies and pulled back drums make this another of the band's forays. It says here pop rock, but I I can hear a slight touch of the country on it. Um, the colour of right is often used as a legal term in the UK and Commonwealth countries, including Canada and is a defence used when somebody breaks a law without the, any intention of doing so, or without knowledge that, that what they were doing was wrong. This sp- song speaks of that in a general moral way, criticising the legalistic and bureaucratic, I'm so full of what is right, I can't see what is good. Piert's good line. Inter- yeah, yeah. Piert's interest in science is also put to good use in the lyric with a particularly effective double meaning, gravity and distance change the passage of light. Gravity and distance change the colour of right. And that's all I've got on it. And I've, I was just sort of looking at the lyrics on that. Uh, nah, I think, it, yeah, take it easy on me now. I'd be there if I could. I'm so full of what is right, I can't see what is good, which is what that was quoted, which is effectively a, is effectively a chorus, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is, you know. 
yeah, it just changes it very slightly. No, I can't see anything else on that that sort of leaps out at me personally, lyrically. I think, again, the, the texture of the song's quite nice, but it um, doesn't really leap out to me. Apart from, I love the intro, and then it just seems to go on, sort of... Yeah, it just sort of cruises sort of goes, along, doesn't it? Yeah, it just goes sort of pedestrian again, by Rush's standards, anyway. Yeah. Well, the next track I think is a bit more interesting and gives us a bit more to talk about. So yeah, time and motion has got some. Uh, yeah, this is it's like they've gone right. We've edged you in now. We're four songs in now. We get to play around a bit, and uh, this is quite an interesting one. It's got like a odd uh, sort of time signature of that main riff that goes on. Yeah. You know, again, I mentioned that grunge influence that they had. Mm -hmm. um right there's a bit of um like piano like a like a piano riff on the keyboard that comes into it as well and it kind of fluctuates between yeah. some quieter parts and then kicks back in again but yeah it's a interesting song what do you think of time and motion uh yeah i it is uh, it to me this is another one of the more dynamic ones on the album um i like it with the aggressive guitar and you've got quite a brooding melody on this as well. Um, it takes it, and I'm looking again at what's written here, it certainly takes the influence from a modern alternative rock scene, um, just with the layers and how it's put together. Uh, it says here, numerous time signatures, again, on this one, floods of heavy guitar. The track brings to mind emerging bands of that time, such as Tool and Primus. Yeah, yeah, that main riff, that diddle, diddle, yeah. Diddle, diddle, diddle. Yeah. yeah, that would that would bring that would bring yeah. bring to mind. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I'm again. I'm that's really, another. Really... Yeah, I should have mentioned them earlier with the uh, yeah more yeah. modern influences. Yeah, uh, it says here the song quickly changes from part to part. Tonal quality of the song remains fairly constant though throughout. The song features little melodic movement, and uh, over five minutes again. This is uh, the, the same. What, what the book's saying here it's arguably another example of an overlong and under edited track again i'm not sure that i agree with that uh despite these potential flaws live and guitar solo is powerful and aggressive and brings to mind the cosmic chaos to which the song refers uh yeah from gravity and distance in the preceding song to time and motion the lyric refers to the effect that these physical ideas or to the effect that these physical ideas have on our experiences and emotions, whether metaphorically or in reality, we are all constantly in motion and everything we experience affects us differently depending on who and where we are at that time. Great yet distant bodies interact in profound ways. The mighty ocean, and this is a quote from one of the lines, I believe, uh, the mighty ocean dances with the moon. They affect each other instantaneously. Trust me, I didn't look at the lyrics too much on this one. Uh, where is that? Oh, I can't see it. I can't see that at all. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, yeah, it is part of, it's almost like effectively like a, a, a chorus type. Really? Um, was there anything lyrically that sort of leapt out at you on Nothing this? Nothing leapt out at me. No, this one's uh, not really... Uh... I'd say, I think for me, the more interesting part of this was the music. Yeah. And the, dynamic, and the dynamics within the song. Um, I think lyrically, yeah, it doesn't... It doesn't sort of leap out at me that much compared to some of some of uh, Piet's other uh, contributions. Um, but yeah, I I did like Lives and Solo on this one as well. It's, uh, an interesting, an interesting sounding solo to me. Um, yeah, let's move on then to yeah. I mean, it's all it goes without saying, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah, it, it solos, does. But... but I would say this prob that that might be one of the best ones on the album. Mm. Uh, moving on to Totem, then we kind of mm. get back to where we were really in the. Uh... This is another good breezy summary song. Um, 
you got that sort of jingly jangly bit that ding 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 yeah riff that then kicks into a nice sort of um it's quite folky yeah and I then think. uh when it comes back into that chorus where you've got that sort of whoa, whoa you know and then yeah. uh again it's another song that just sort of cruises along really without yeah, it Not does. Without really uh, rustling too many feathers, really, um, and no, this is it... where I can't, it kind of perplexes me that that this Neil considers this to be his masterpiece when this is the one he seems to be doing the least on drum wise. Because <coughs> in this, this one, one, it's he's at his most relaxed. He is. He's just. It's more like subtle tom work than anything else uh, on this one, but it's not that high in the mix. Hmm. It's more on the bottom end of the spectrum. Um, yeah, I, it, it's not a it's not a bad little song. It's sort of and like you say, it's quite light and it's got that very light folky guitar, which just sort of again it just sort of tends to bounce along a little bit with this. Um, lyrically, it's um, sort of. It's a, a lighter reflection. It says here, and I, I sort of was looking at the lyrics and then reading what's in here. Um, it's sort of like a mishmash of all religions, really. I've got twelve disciples and a Buddha smile, the Garden of Allah, Viking and Valhalla, a miracle once in a while. I've got a pantheon of pantheon of am, animals in a pagan soul, Vishnu and God. Gaia, Aztec and Maya dance around my totem pole. Um, and then, of course, it's the, the, the lyric, I believe in what I see, I believe in what I hear, I believe that what I'm feeling changes how the world appears. Um, it's, and the comment on this is, the playful folky track is a considerably lighter reflection on religion than the scathing attacks that Peart would deliver on snakes and arrows a decade later. Nevertheless, it is an indicator of his deeply sceptical attitude towards it. After listing aspects of multitudin multitudinous ancient faiths, Peart goes on to compare the role of modern media to that of organised religion. His deep cynicism regarding both is plain to see. Um, once again, I was just looking at the lyrics. Uh, where does he say that? If he does, actually, yeah. Yeah, angels and demons dancing in my head, lunatics and monsters underneath my bed, media messiahs praying on my fears, pop culture prophets playing in my ears. Well, this is a common theme around this time. A lot of bands would, yeah, uh, you know, would talk about this. I'm just thinking of uh, a particular Genesis song as well. Uh, Jesus, oh, not, he knows me. Jesus, he knows and me. And that that was from oh, that was 1991. So it was a little bit of a predecessor to this. Yeah. But, uh, well, a very cynical overview of the TV preachers. Yeah, but that was with, with some justification. Yeah, no, I would, I would, you know, I think that with that, some that justification. Particular, well, religion and spirituality or faith was commodified and sold as a business, you know. And, well, yeah, it was, it, and, and and in that it process, was, it becomes very homogenized. You know, you could buy it? your salvation, and yeah. uh yeah, you give me this and you're you're all right. You know? Yeah, you, you'll you'll be saved, or you can just you know show how much you love God by buying this T-shirt or buying this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Pendant or, or, or yeah, or buying this book or, or buy yeah, this or book and attend this event. Yeah, it all yeah, became it, very it, it's, it's commercialized and rightfully so. It did. Uh, it did get the uh, criticism it it deserves, but I dare say. In the following decades, uh, we was guilty of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, Especially I, uh, post nine eleven. <clears throat> but uh, well, yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Because that um, then led the way to your Dawkins and your Hitchens, and they were just, you know, the way those authors were pushed as well. Oh yeah, yeah, it, it definitely. It was all in that in itself was a hard sell. You know, it, it really was. 
Uh, so it sort of fell into the trap that they were accusing. Yes, ex it, it, the, it, the exact, exact point I'm making. It, yeah. it, exactly, it was just I just fell into the same trap. Yeah, really. the, the priests, yeah. the 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 priests of these evangelical sort of telly. Yeah. Telly, what's it? Telly evangelism. It wasn't really, it wasn't really a, was it that big a thing here? Uh, it wasn't here. It was in America. Because and in it, America, you would have like they would have their own channels, wouldn't they? Where in in England, you only had four channels at the time. Yeah, yeah the two obviously TV BBC One, BBC Two were um were yeah. you know government funded yeah. and yeah, uh, ITV and Channel Four were advert funded. So you wouldn't the whole one thousand channels kind of. We would have to buy that later yeah. on with cable telly, but it wasn't wasn't really a big thing here. So no, the telly it, evangelist it, thing it, wasn't. It, it, America yeah. really was the epicenter of all of that. Yeah, I think there were other countries that were doing it, but as well, the but particularly America. the priest or the pastor becoming a rock star, effectively. Well, basically living then, a rock star lifestyle. Yeah, and then uh, private jets and all the limousines and all this sort of stuff, and you think. But Dawkins and Hitchens became rock stars. Absol absolutely, yeah. they did as they did as well. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, <laughs> I think the word I think the word hypocrite comes to mind. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, yeah, they, I thought the what they said about Piet here on this is um, yeah, quite quite an interesting thing. I mean it when we get to snakes and arrows yeah i think we'll we'll see it we'll talk a bit more about that there the only other comment i've got about totem this track is licensed subtle textual work on the song is one of the most interesting aspects of it uh some soft celtic melodies and swirling harmonics add something of a transcendent layer to this proudly terrestrial song um, but, but like you, it it's not um it's not a horrible song to listen to. It's sort of yeah. You know, to me, it doesn't go on so long. It's not exactly before. Slayer. So. No, it's not. Well, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not. Yeah, well, I'm not an aficionado of Slayer anyway. <laughs> I mean, I, are they the ones that do that really short song, or was that somebody else? That's No Palm Death. Oh, that's <laughs> No Palm Death. I beg yeah. your pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I always, oh. Admit, yeah, that was it. That was a classic. That's a classic. Yeah, that yeah that's what he says. Always oh, an I, epic. That one. That's it. <laughs> oh, <it's> just... <laughs> Point is, though, you wouldn't want them to do a set of numbers like that. <laughs> yeah. just go, they sort of did in the early days. Oh, did they really? Yeah, yeah the, a, fir the first two albums, basically, you've got. Um, that was the. Like, let's just put the cherry on the cake, really. But they. they yeah. the Songs were generally about 30, 40 seconds. Wow. Some yeah. of them, like, a, you know, it was uh, John Peel, because there was a bit of a scene. It was a grindcore scene. So it was Napalm, Death, Extreme Noise, Terror, the early days of Carcass. Um, and yeah, like, the, he was at, a, John Peel said he was at a show watching Extreme Noise, Terror, and there was a song, and it went over a minute long. And when they finished, someone in the crowd went, fucking prog rockers. <laughs> because it was over a minute <laughs> so dear oh dear I mean I know that people, some people's attention spans doesn't go that long but come um, on a minute good grief <laughs> um, that was considered an epic <laughs> yeah it was, uh, yeah you got that's the second album you got 27 songs on that uh, well, well. Oh, and 20, 28 songs on your first album, Scum. Yeah, that was the... Uh... And the song you're we're talking about is You Suffer. Yeah, that's what it's um, called, You Suffer, yeah. And then uh, on the next album, Harmony Corruption has 11 songs, and all the songs were like three to four minutes long, oh, and they I got thought... called sellouts. Oh, did they? <laughs> dear, oh, dear. Um, but yeah, they 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 moved on from it pretty quick. But they said, yeah, even to this day, we are oh, you that band that does the ten second long songs. But, yeah. but it's a bit like with Rush, you know, you you speak speak to anyone about Rush, and oh, twenty minute long songs. No, I can't be having yeah, that. But they, yeah, but that's only yeah. one part of their. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. It's the same yeah. with uh, Napalm Death. Say... Not, 
I dare say it's the same with a lot of yeah. games. You like normally get, get um, sort of three quarters into the set. They normally just do a couple just to... But when they do, you suffer. It's normally just out of nowhere. They just do it like yeah. a song are just quickly finished and they just go... Yeah, and he, he sort of just goes... You missed go. it, didn't you? You missed it. Uh, Concentrate. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing it again. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> it's too much log old work, yeah. Um, <laughs> should we move on to the next one? Go for it. Dog years. Yes. Well, what's your feelings about this one? Um, I quite like this one. It's quite a happy, upbeat song. I know it's not about dogs, but it kind of does remind me of my dog being running around, waggling his tail with his tongue out, making a bloody nuisance of himself, but he's yeah. He's happy while he does it, so you can't help it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, um, uh... Dog Years is a, uh, it's got a bit of social commentary in it, isn't it? You read out the. Uh... I'd have to read the lyrics completely. I mean, I don't. Is there nothing you... in your book? It just says I have. I have got stuff about it, but I he uses the dog, anything. the seven years to a, seven dog years to a human year, as yeah. an analogy um, with a bit of social commentary thrown in apparently yes it, it um i mean i'd have to read it when i it's the season of the itch with every scratch it reappears yes yeah but no this is a nice song apart from that i like the um that jingly jang main riff and then ding 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 it's just a upbeat yeah. It is, yeah, it's an it's an upbeat one, but this song does actually have Peter gets slated for the lyrics on this one. Um, oh, it's not as it, bad as uh... no, I don't think it's as bad as Tosh. <laughs> Sorry, um, it says here while ma many Rush fans regard Peter as one of the all time great lyricists, and he is, or he was, a great number regard his lyrics as verbose and pretentious. Since his fantastical uh, sword, swords and sorcery lyrics that began in earnest on Caressa Steel to the widely criticised Tai Shan <laughs> and beyond, there is probably no Rush lyric that has been more criticised than Dog Years. Written early in the album's writing sessions while Peart was hung over, the song does contain, despite its critics, a few particularly pleasing lines the most notable of which is a pun that is only available to those who read the lyric sheet and have some knowledge of ancient Greece. In the dog days, people look to Sirius, as in Sirius the star, the dog star. Uh, while the listener may initially hear Lee singing the word Sirius, Sirius is in fact known as the dog star. Uh, the ancient Greeks who saw this particularly bright star shining during the day attributed hot days, known as dog days, to the extra light it provided in daytime. Uh, Piet also indulges in an act of self-reference back to the Signals album. And I did look at that. It says here, one sniff at the hydrant and the answer is automatic. Regardless of the lyric, Dog Years is Rush at their heavy best and is a joyful and puerile addition to the album, it says here. Yeah, I've got my wires crossed as well. I had the, it's not got the jingly jangly bit, it's got the pretty driving riff actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's and quite it's sort of, punky it, actually. Yeah. It, you know, to me, as, as punky as Rush get, but yeah. Yeah. It has that, to me, it had that slightly sort of punkish vibe and i think it was it, on this one the drums are driving it along quite a lot and then it, and we, along with the guitar and then when it comes back to the lyrics it sort of just sort of lays off it's dynamically it just sort of comes down a bit but it's still pushing along um to give the space for the words really i was just looking to see if there was any other lyrics there that sort of let out um was there anything there that you, anything sort of catch no, you? I just, I just like the chorus. You, you just Dog like the chorus. Dog years. Yes, yeah, it's da, a season da, 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 da. <laughs> If every scratch it reappears, yeah. I can't see anything else apart from the ones that, that have been mentioned there. 
because I'd say that sort of the one sniff at the hydrant, you know, cause that signals, isn't it? So, <laughs> yeah, I again, I've not really got a lot of say. I think it's a fairly like you, it's a fairly joyful. Just again, it's just sort of moves along, and it does. It's not out of place on this album at all. Not no, no, anyway. not at all. I think this is quite a consistent album. Actually, it's just. Mm. Uh... It, it to me, uh, uh, and we've already said it, it. It doesn't hit the heights of its. No, it just kind of it, it's them. Sort it doesn't hit. It doesn't hit the heights. Laying of the back on the back foot yeah. like they've done on that trilogy that we uh, that I struggled through really, but yeah. Um, virtue, virtuality. Up next. Yes. Yeah, virtuality. Um, like the riff opening riff on this. I mean, it's. Yeah, we we. I mean, I know we always things say kick in a bit towards the end, actually. Yeah, this one. It, it, yeah, it does. It does. Um, so it says here again. I'm only going to quote what's here. Opening with what surely is one of Lyson's most spectacular riffs. Virtuality is an upbeat ode to the internet of 1996. Peart's decision to write about a technology that was, in many respects, in its infancy inevitably doomed the song to date extremely quickly. Nevertheless, it's something of a time capsule. Lifeson's discordant harmonics during the pre-chorus are designed to mimic the dial-up tone of an old-style modem. Uh, although the song's lyric has met criticism from those that see it as a little too hackneyed, the song is a genuine expression of interest in what is unquestionably one of the greatest technological advances of humankind. The line, I can save the universe in a grain of sand, is a fine example of Peart's use of poetic imagery to speak fact, since almost limitless information is indeed stored on silicon chips. Um, I think the, as it say, I think the chorus is, uh, Net boy, net girl, send your impulse around the world. Oh, yeah. yeah. Put your message in a modem and throw it in the cyber sea. So pretty much uh, sums everything up, really, on that, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so, like I say, it's just how quick, um, how much it's developed since then. It's almost... I mean, I remember them dial-up tones. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at the beginning. And of course, it just doesn't happen now. You don't need that. Uh, everything's so much quicker and slicker. Uh, it says here, the simple bones of the song are fleshed out with intricate textural layers and a memorable melody. It is actually quite a memorable melody. Alex plays around with the guitar on this one as well. That, that, with that, do, 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 do. yeah, you know, the, he's got that. I don't know how to describe it, but yeah, it's a bit off kilter, yeah. shall we say? Yeah, it, it is, and I think. Uh, and you got that guy where he's going that do 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 do, and then uh, yeah. Neil's going bum, 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 that yeah on the cowbell thing that he does, which, which it, sounds yeah. like the one he used was it back in Xanadu? Yeah, well, no, that have been um, it's the trees off of Hemisphere. Was it the trees? Yeah, it's more like that. Although yeah. he's although that's more cowbell with the trees. Yeah. Whereas with Xanadu, it's more like the blocks. I think I'm blocks. thinking Xanadu like, though, but yeah, he does it might that. Be, yeah. Yeah. It, it is that it, it's just using a slightly different voice and different bits of percussion. Um, yeah, it's got it's got that. It gives it that slightly quirky feel to it. Um, it again, probably this song it makes this. It says here, and I, I sort of wouldn't disagree with it. I like the sort of heaviness of it, but uh, and again, the way it cuts back to those bits where you can there's space there and you can hear these little bits going on, uh, makes it probably one of the a strong point in the album. Um, despite the fact it says here, despite the fact that it's unlikely to be noted by many Rush fans as a favorite. No, it's it's, again, it's quite song. pedestrian, but yeah, yeah, it's quite pedestrian. No, it doesn't not a standout track, but doesn't do any harm either. No, I think again, it's it, compared to others, it's possibly got a little bit more dynamic range in it. Um, but yeah, I don't think there was anything lyric other than lyrics that sort of leapt out at me. I thought, oh, well, that was interesting, or that 
sounds a bit silly or whatever. Uh, I'll take it again. You didn't. Nothing really apart from the the chorus bit. Really, that's the sort of the, the hook of the whole song. Really, uh, nah. no, 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 I can't see anything. It, well, no, well just, let's move shall on. we move yeah. on? Um, right. So next up um, is by yeah. a, a country mile, the highlight in the album for me, and as always is the case. Rush's worst album will still have one of Rush's best songs on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think this album, this song is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's hit me ever since I first heard it, and I've loved it ever since. I think this is some of Rush's best music, some of Alex's best guitar, and some of Neil's best lyrics. Um, these are the type of yeah. lyrics that Neil is yeah. loved for. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a beautiful, uplifting, inspiring song. Um, if ever you're feeling down and you you need a lift and a reminder of uh, mm-hmm. things not as bad as they seem to keep going, then definitely yeah. listen to Resist. It's a fantastic yeah. song. And um, yeah. this song is worth the admittance alone for this mm-hmm. album. Yeah, I think it, this is the one that sort of t- this has stood the test of time. Yeah, uh, this one of the, of all of them, uh, it was played on other tours, and it was also played. They stripped it right back, and they rearranged played, it as an acoustic. Played, song, and they played it acoustically, and it still worked. Yeah, because effectively, it's a folk song. Effectively, mm. you got them. Uh, I don't know. Have you got anything else on this with regards to the background of this song? Pretty much just summed it up in the sentence, really. I think. Yeah, no, I, th- I think fine. this song speaks for itself. It does. Yeah, it does. I'll just, I'll quote, I'll put. I mean, it's one of his most it. emotional. I don't even know if it's a guitar solo. It's more just the, the chorus kind of is just the guitar melody, isn't it? It, it is. It is. Yeah. It's. Um, I mean, it's not really a solo, is it? But. Well, it's not. It's not. But it's a solo, just but as it's just that poignant. beautiful. Beautiful yeah. sounding as and as emotional driven as yeah. the solo in um limelight, for example. Mm. It's yeah. just the way he just holds it's the, the note, just lets the guitar Yeah, he just sing. lets the guitar yeah. sing, really. Mm. It's effectively just a beautiful melodic line over the top. It is really nice. It is I think it's been pretty well captured on this album as well. It's it's Probably the highlight of the recording process as well. I think it just yeah. it right. Uh, yeah, I you're right. The lyrics do stand for theirself. Uh, it says here, resist. Originally titled Taboo, to reference Freud's book Totem and Taboo, the band eventually decided to opt for its simpler final title. Riffing on one of Oscar Wilde's, and you've already mentioned this, most famous quotes, I can learn to resist anything but temptation. Uh, the lyric urges one to feed one's virtues and overcome one's failures. The entire lyric can be summed up in its final lies, lines, lies, final lines. You can fight without ever winning, but never, ever win without a fight. Lee often introduced the song after adopting a Scottish accent as inspired by the great country of Scotland. Lyson incorporates some of the Celtic-inspired melodies he had become enamoured with into the piece, foregoing a traditional solo and instead included a slow and soaring melodic guitar line, which is exactly what we've both alluded to and spoke about. It is... It is to me, yeah, you would rate this as one of their classics. This this song and the fact that it has stood the test of time, it's never boring to listen to, and the fact that they played it on other tours as well, uh, it speaks for itself. Um, yeah, it, uh, the, I think it's interesting I, when you listen to it when they do it acoustically. It really, um, it's still. I, I still think it gets that. It still it's a that. song, yeah. It's, a, it's it, 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 it still gets you. It still gets yeah. you. You know, 
So, yeah, it's just that it's good. It's a different interpretation, but it's it's yeah. two sides of the same song, isn't it? It's, yeah, indeed. I'm glad this version exists. I'm glad they you have uh, the live version as its counterpart. And um, indeed, yeah, yeah, but I do like. I don't think. Yeah, I think I wonder if they tried to emulate the studio version live, if it would work quite as well, because it is quite... Well, there is... I thought there was a version of it live on one of the live albums, which would be different stages. I'm sure it's on there. I haven't got that album, funny enough. I think it's on there. Because that's not a concert, is it? That's just a collection of... It's a collection, but it was... The official... Uh, it, it, yeah, it was the official live album different stages because obviously there was one from an earlier era which was taken from Hammersmith Odeon but the main guts of it uh, the first two discs are taken from the Test for Echo tour so that's worth getting in it is so... worth getting I mean I have got it and I'm just, there is a full band version of Resist on it I'm certain okay. Um but, I just thought it was a live compilation album. It no, really no, it was. It was. It, they all I mean, they recorded it. But... They recorded it in different places. Yeah, but it was all stitched together. It was from the Test for Echo tour, and it plays yeah. like a set list from a show. Yeah, like, it, and so, it is, yeah, so it's just it as does. much an album then as All the World Is a Stage or Exit Stage, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, okay, right. I'll have to it, it, it yeah. you'd have to, but it's three discs. You've got the two from the Test for Echo. And going back to something that you asked the question a good few episodes. We get paid ago. next week, don't we? So I'll get it on pay. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. Um this is the first tour that they did two sets. Right. It all started. Test, yeah, I did it ask start, that. It started on this tour, Test for Echo. This was the one that mm. they started doing the longer sets. And uh yeah. Uh, but we'll go into that when we get, when we review the live albums anyway but uh and this is the album this is the tour that they played the whole of 2112 which they'd never done before right it was definitely this tour right okay okay so that's yeah, at that the... point they had done it but it was normally an abbreviated it, yeah it was usually slightly most... snipped version yeah, but that yeah one it's they slightly snipped it might have been yeah it might have been at the most five parts which i think they did actually on 2112 uh, but no, yeah, this is a brilliant seven. song, and if anything, I would say you know this is in my top, easily in my top ten Rush songs, possibly top five, and I would, I would even play this song to someone that I wouldn't even be trying to get him into Rush. I would just. No, I think this. I think this is a song that you could play to anybody because I think it absolutely is that, anybody. Yeah, yeah, it's got that accessibility, and it's got that as you said, it's got that emotion. And it's quite emotive behind it and just beautifully played. Mm. It's just a beautifully played song. So, yeah. And again, it stood the test of time. You can hear that. And I've, like you, listened to it and it still sounds pretty fresh. I think of, of all of them, this is the song that hasn't really dated. I think the rest mm. of them have, but this one hasn't. Yeah. I mean, there are a couple that. I mean, Driven's still pretty good, but I think this is the one that's, um, this one's sort of come out. If we were to put together a compilation, yeah, this would... You work. would you would that, end up putting this one. non-negotiable. This yeah. has to go on it, yeah. I, yeah think, I think you would put this one on. Uh, but I, was there any lyrics you wanted to quote or... The whole any... the whole song is quotable, yeah, well, it, but yeah, um, I think the... the, the uh, the climax of the song really is uh, you can surrender without a prayer, but never pray without surrender. Mm -hmm. You can fight without ever winning, but never win without a fight. I mean, yeah, yeah which is brilliant. what was, you know, I think it does. It just culminates in that, doesn't it? It's just they're quite a short set of lyrics, but they really, yeah, I think he was absolutely on form with that one. Really superb, superb little number that. So, are we going to move on, or are I'm we just going to going through we, or, the thing? Just in, or are we going to resist? I can learn to resist anything but frustration. I can learn to resist with anything but lay, aiming low. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
No, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Cool. It's now How two, many we got? Two, two songs left. Two to go. And it's um, Limbo. Limbo. Another instrumental. Yes. Well, is it an instrumental though? Because you do well, get a bit of... Uh... There's some weird incidental sort of words, but I can't make them out and I've got no... Um, it, it, oh, they've, I've got a little comment about that. Um, but I, I didn't it, think, yeah, I would. He just kind of just, I he just sort of harmonizes along, doesn't he? To the... Yeah, there's just a little bit of that, but it, there's a sort of a little bit going on in the background, but there's no sort of credit given to it or what it says. Oh, no, yeah, 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 I think it's an instrumental. So no, they, it just says instrumental. They say it's instrumental. Anyway. It is, and um, yeah, with uh, with uh, Geddy sort of doing them sort of soaring R's and whatever in the background and whatever. Um, got any info on this? Have you got anything? No info as such, but um, no, it's, it's a. What do you think? It's a good. It? It's a good instrumental. I quite like. It. It's a bit. Um, What's the word? It's a good song to daydream to. Yeah. Isn't it? It's uh yeah. I sort of bring to mind like I would if I was gonna make a video for it, I'd have like a like a camera sort of scanning over different horizons. I'd sort of mm. cut to mountain tops, then like a city, the next thing, and sort of yeah, like a horizontal not horizontal, like a like a a camera on the bottom of a helicopter, say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, I, yeah. but I would have the footage sort of speeded up daylight, yeah. night time, and something like that. I'd it sort of has it's not like it's not like Floyd, but it has that. I think this would be a good, of... good soundtrack uh, to have actually whilst doing a run, yeah, yeah, yeah. whilst on a run. I think it, yeah, it's not, it's definitely not like Floyd, but it's sort of of that Floydish inspiration. Like, I mean, you saying about like seeing landscapes and uh, and things. That's the sort of thing Floyd would do. Yeah, you know, and did. It, it just does that. Although the music is not like Floyd, if you, uh, I've, the only comment I've got on this, and I'm again, I'm reading from this. <laughs> Excuse me. It says here with its title a pun it's a pun on the right wing talk show on right wing talk show host rush limbaugh i think that's his name this strange instrumental is a patchwork of whirling textures tumbling fills and surreal rock before working on the song piert had been trying to remember the lyrics to the 1962 novelty hit monster mash which led to several sample ah oh, here we go <laughs> which led to several samples from the track being included on limbo so that's what's going on in the background so little little samples from uh, monster mash okay right now he says here as Piet explains our co-producer it was a graveyard smash yeah yeah exactly our co-producer Peter, Peter Collins went out and bought a CD that had a compilation of some funny songs like Monster Mash. We got listening to it, thinking about how funny it was, and decided to put some samples of it on on this song. He said, "That's Igor going goo mash goo." We had to get special permission and pay money and everything. You think it's so strange? when you just want to make a joke and people want you to get permission and pay money for it. That's a serious business, you know. And... <clears throat> well, yeah, indeed. It, it's um, wherever royalties are involved, everyone wants their slice of the pie, don't they? Yeah, and, you know, the, the it, they're even taking <laughs> the slightest resemblance is the grounds to sue people for now. And, the, you know, the, you've got this <clears> famous <throat> case. We had a few famous cases recently um, with uh, robbing, I forget the guy's name, but he got sued by the estate of Marvin Gaye and to pay oh. out quite a bit of money for that. Um, the amount of money Puff Daddy has to pay out on a daily basis, apparently. I mean, I think it. I think what he has to pay works out so much a day. 
uh, to Sting because apparently he didn't use the sample for um, every breath you take. Apparently he did ah, that right. permission. But then didn't. now you're getting people suing for oh because it slightly resembles their song, and they're saying I didn't even know I, I didn't. Yeah. Even... <laughs> well, it was really. Um, I mean, I suppose Iron Maiden about... recently had to settle out a cult. Sorry. Um, really? Wow. Yeah. Um, for someone that did a uh, said the opening of uh, "Hello, Bid I Name" was yeah. taken from one of their songs. Uh, for the first mm-hmm. time since the song came out, that was a mainstay in the band's set list. And yeah, for the, for the first time ever, that song wasn't played. You know, it, okay. it had been taken out. So he, that's how serious it got. It was like, don't play it until this gets sorted because yeah, it looked like. But I think that did get settled outside of cult in the end. I think they just went, just take this money and fuck off, basically. <laughs> but but then the. Uh, most notably recently, Ed Sheeran. Um, he was who I was going to mention. Yeah, and uh, he ended profile. up taking a guitar into Colt and because uh, apparently it was the particular notes that they'd used. And he said, well, here's these mm-hmm. notes. I'll play it over and over again in a loop. And he sung about 20 songs or however many songs yeah. using those four calls. And he basically proved the point. Yeah. If you're going to go down this road, then no then one... everyone's go- everyone's going to yeah. be accused of plagiarism, basically. Yeah. And uh, and the it, Who yeah. addressed it in their last album that they released a few Christmases ago. Uh, the opening track to that, all all this music will fade. Um, that that, that subject was addressed in that song, which I thought had some pretty good lyrics and yeah. Well, the Who, yeah. the, the Who were accused themselves, weren't they, uh, in the early days that they ripped off somebody? Yeah. I, I can't remember what song it was. Was it Substitute? Well, the lyrics for that would have uh, been ironic, yeah. <laughs> was it Substitute? I think it was the guitar riff. It was a, it was the music, not the not the. Lyrics. Oh, the right, yeah. Was it was it Substitute or was it? Do, 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 do. Yeah. Was it the Kinks? Something I, I I can't remember. Somebody got the ump about it anyway. Yeah. Uh, and there was something going on about, but I can't remember if it was substitute. It was some. I think it. That's the one. That this is a mind. good verse from it. I don't mind other people, other guys ripping off my song. I'd be a liar if I said I'd never done no wrong. Mm. And this sound that we share has already been played, and it hangs in the air. All this music will fade, and then back into the chorus. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you've only got so many notes, so oh, many yeah. chords. Yeah, it, inevitably there are going to be things that cross over. And um, how many times have you listened to music? I've certainly done it. You think that reminds me of something? That re- that sounds like something else. You know, it just might just be a little bit, and you just think, oh, that sounds like whatever. And I've certainly found myself doing that, sort of the deja vu. You can play it all day long, and especially now with algorithms and AI, like the Absolutely. different AIs and whatnot, you you can you can point it out all day. And and when you do point it out, it's just yeah, okay, good for you. What well have you done. written then? Yeah, well you know, done. it's yeah. it's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. uh. Yeah, it gets, it, 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 it gets a bit tedious, actually. It it does, it does. But if if there's a buck to be made, then people will go for it, won't they? I was recently, you know, someone pointed out some riff that Metallica then used on one of it. I was like, yeah, but that's still the better album. It's still the better song. Like, what, are you saying... We should all throw our Metallica albums out and buy this guy's album for this ever so slight variation on the riff. It, it's still not as good a song. So, yeah. Yeah. But there you go. Well, well, right, we've been chipping away at this stone for a while, Paul. Shall yes, we, we uh, ha- Yeah, let's go. Can we finish it, it off? <laughs> yeah, let's think so. Go on, him. So, you, the you last track, um, Carve Away the Stone. There you go. I said chip away at the stone. But, well, yeah, that's one. That's one of the lines, though. This is um again a bit of a breezy number, which I keep referring to. But this is a breezy album. But this is a good, memorable song that closes a a 
not 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 terrible album by any means of the imagination, but a very a very laid back album. Laid mm-hmm. certainly laid back by Rush's standards. It's an enjoy, but this one sticks in your head a bit more. It got me a bit of more of an earworm for the chorus, and it's a, it's upbeat and an, an uplifting one. But yeah, it brings brings together a, a fairly consistent, if unremarkable album. Um with one of the best songs they ever wrote in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh yeah, I mean you 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 said chip away the stone, but of course that's there. That's in the in the chorus effective. That is in the chorus, yeah. If the first one, chip away the stone. Chip away oh, there the you stone. Go. I weren't yeah. wrong. Yeah. No, you weren't wrong. It's, <laughs> no, it's just not the song title. Yeah. Uh make the burden lighter if you must roll that rock alone. So it, uh, again, it says here, it, again, this reveals Peart's interest in mythology. Carve away the stone refers to the ancient myth of Sisyphus. I That's think. what I was thinking. I, 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 I think I, I, it, I had I, an inkling that was what he was aiming yeah, for. But yeah, yeah but uh, thanks for it, confirming that. I was I've, well. That's how I've pronounced. I it. was it, just it, flicking it, through it, over breakfast. My uh, it's either that or we both got it wrong. Yeah, my big book <laughs> of Greek mythology, and I, I was yeah. kind of just wondering. I wonder if yeah. anyone's ever wrote a song about. Yeah. 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 He's <laughs> the king who was punished by the gods for his arrogance. His eternal torment was to spend every day rolling a stone to the top of a hill, only to watch it roll back down to its starting place at the day's end. Peart uses this imagery as a metaphor for our own troubles and guilt, suggesting that if we must roll the stone, we could at least try to make it easier on ourselves and gradually chip away at it. Is what you quoted. Peart's lyric makes the point that it is much easier to offer advice than to take it. The entire song is a plea to a friend to chip and carve away at their stone until the last line, which says, if you could just move yours, I could get working on, on my own. While the track's slow tempo and grungy opening, and, and grungy opening, it may appear an odd choice for the album's finale. However, with its subtle use of odd time signatures, which are in there again, in the chorus, as well as the song's sprightly bridge section, which is really good. I quite like the bridge section of this. It's really, you get, there's a lot of Tom work going on there. This song does have its merits, despite being largely forgotten within Rush's enormous repertoire. Um, Again, I don't. The lyrics on there are not too bad, really. Uh, but I'm glad you. No, agree I think it makes me. a good point. You know, it's, yeah, I think it, so. We 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 we've all we we can all we all solve everyone else's problems except our own, don't we? We. Well, yeah. But I think we sort of. I think the <laughs> human nature is to, yeah, focus on something else so that you don't have to look confront the things that you're that you really should pay attention to. Um, it's always put it, you know, put it off, put it off, put it off. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad that you agree with me that it's uh, the pronunciation of Sisyphus anyway. Um, because I was, I was all thinking, is it? Uh, oh, I was being completely sarcastic. I didn't. I, I... No, uh, <laughs> oh, it's fair enough. I didn't get that either. So there you go. Um, yeah. I can put it down to age, Joe. I'm getting too old. Um, yeah, it, it, apart from that, I mean, it's it doesn't really sort of um, the lyrics don't really grab you. It's just really them those choruses. I mean, the second time it says "Carve away the stone," which is the song title. Uh, make a graven image with some features of your own. Uh, roll away the stone, roll away the stone. If you, if you could, and that's it. That's the last one. If you could just move yours, I could get working on my own. So, the, it's the same pattern, of course. It's just a slightly different play on the words each time. So, in that respect, it's quite subtle, quite clever, really. Um, right. Well, we've got about ten minutes until Zoom kicks us off. So right. okay, I think I've pretty much summed up my thoughts on the album. A uh, yeah, yeah a I... solid but unremarkable overall. Yeah, I think um, so. Again, 
and that's by Rush's standards. Uh, many a lesser band would be quite happy to have this on their under their belt. Mm-hmm. And if uh, if they're only going to make one album, for example, they'd quite like yeah. to make an album as good as Rush's worst. Yeah, but by Rush standards, it's a bit of a a bit of a cruising yeah. album, especially after the 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 uh, Pelter that was the album that. F- that preceded it yeah, but yeah okay. what's your closing thoughts Paul my my closing thoughts um pretty much the same as you I think it's um mostly I think it's an album sort of of its time uh it it's fairly consistent but you could probably end up sort of forgetting a lot of these if you know what I mean and, and I don't mean that in a nasty way there are other songs of Rush that you would immediately, and the only one on this one, I think, for me, well, there's a couple. I don't mind Test for Echo, the title track. Driven is pretty good as well, but Resist would take it for me. Yeah, as, absolutely. As, as, as the, but it, um, the thing, so yeah, a good album, but I, it's not as good as its predecessor. And it, I personally think it wasn't recorded as well as Counterparts. I think no. Counterparts just had so much going for that it was just brilliantly done but this as a follow-up it wasn't as good but obviously because of all the things that we've spoken about which what happened with rush after this album um i was gonna just quickly comment on the artwork uh the album cover uh features an inuk shook which is an inuit signpost that indicates a high point of land or it can also be something as a point of um, a, a, a landmark or even something commemorative, which is peculiar to the Inuits, which are the indigenous tribes in North America, which is Canada and US. Um, that was just a little bit. And also the thing about the um, radar dishes on it as well, which are on the back part of the cover. Again, it was just all about communication and, again, uh, uh, alluding to the test for Echo uh, with the, with the what they call here a SETI, S-E-T-I, radio receivers, which is uh, search for extraterrestrial ter- uh, intelligence. Um, I'm just trying to go through... There's not really much little of... characters on the yeah, thing there. Yeah. I didn't know if they would be like characters from X, but from old Rush no. albums or something like that. Like, would but you no, get the? No, it doesn't look like it, does it? Oh. Um, not to me, and I ain't got a magnifying glass. That's what I would have done. I think yeah. would have gone put, yeah. put him from that album on. I think with album. regards to chart positions um, on this, Canada, it was number three. UK, it was 25. And then the US... It was number five, so it did sell reasonably well uh, with this. And obviously, um, with regards to the artwork, there's still some various bits of them as kids, pictures of them, some stuff there from 2001 Space Oddity, uh, accompanies the lyrics to Totem. Uh, But, of course, the big thing before we um, go off air... Uh, the tour was sixty-eight dates, and again, it was Which only is, North, North. Yeah, it was only North America. Running the park by yeah, by yeah. Rush's standards. It yeah, was 60, yeah, it was just sixty-eight dates running from October ninety-six through to December ninety-six. Then there was a break, and then they reconvened May ninety-seven to July ninety-seven. Um, the songs they played off of the album, Driven. Half the World, Limbo, Virtuality, Test for Echo, Resist, uh, which was at first alternated with Time and Motion, but then Time and Motion got dropped. Uh, So that's on that particular tour. Uh, I dare say we haven't really got time because it was shortly after this tour that Neil had the first his daughter was tragically killed in a car accident. I don't know if you want to take this up with the next one. It's we... probably best because it's obviously well documented anyway. Yeah, but it, it is well documented. It gives us a bit of more context for yeah. the background or what the stakes yeah. were for uh, 
yeah. vapor trails. But it, but, it, but, it, but it wasn't long after the tour had finished. It was literally about a month yeah. after they had finished the, the tragic news came through. Of, yeah. We'll cover it on the next we'll, couple we'll of albums because there's the a bit one. of... Yeah, there's a lot there yeah. to talk about, actually. So, yeah. Well, folks, thanks for watching, as always. And, again, this is your show as well as it is ours. So leave us comments. What do you think of Test for Echo? What do you think? What's your favourite song off it? How do you think this album's aged? What was your reaction when you first got it? And, uh, yeah, we're... We're getting our, we are plowing through this. So we had a slight deviation last week, but obviously this week we've come back with Rush. But we're doing another detour next week, and we're doing the up until this point, the uh, soul solo album from Geddy Lee. So next week we are covering my favourite headache, and uh, I'm looking forward to this one actually. Yeah. Um, and that'll be the next one. So yeah, as I always. Go back to the beginning if you haven't already and uh, work your way through the series. Um, we've both been really enjoying this. Hopefully you can uh, get a bit of insight into Rush or just get reminded or reacquainted with some old albums. Or if you're new to Rush, this could be your... your uh, We could be your companions as you work your way yeah. through the catalogue yourselves. So have a good week, everyone, and we shall see you all soon. Cheerio, folks. See you. Take care. All the best.